Right then, yeah. Um, I just wanted to see if you can just give a, a bit of an update regarding the COVID-19 situation on campus. Well, the COVID-19 situation uh, has improved dramatically since about 14 days ago when uh, I asked our undergraduate students in particular uh, to limit their activities to essential activities only. And that was in response, as you well know, to a small number of our students who chose to ignore uh, public health department uh, mandates about staying in isolation and quarantine, people trying to test out of quarantine, uh, positive folks hosting parties and going to parties, uh, very large gatherings that were being held uh, in private housing and uh, in uh, 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 dormitories and, and a few uh, 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 sorority and fraternity houses as well. And uh, so what happened was that resulted, as you well know, and a increase in the number of cases that we expected, uh, several fold increase, uh, but uh, the value and the excellence of the testing protocol that we put in place, we have a test that's so sensitive, scalable and affordable that we've been testing, as you know, twice per week, and that testing within itself gives us an opportunity as one of our uh, developers of this test says, where most universities are testing a subsample, they only see the tip of the iceberg of those uh, people that are positive. We see the entire iceberg. And that's why we ask people to test at least twice a week. And in some cases, we uh, may be testing some people in high risk groups three times a week as a way of mitigating the spread. So notwithstanding that spike that went up to about 2.89 uh, or a, not a percentage uh, positive rate, we have been able to mitigate that now to a seven day rolling average of about 0.44%, but we're not out of the woods yet. We really do need to continue uh, to adhere to practical things like not participating in large gathering, not doing those things that we know are gonna cause the spread of the disease and potentially cause us to end this hybrid version of education that we embarked upon. Right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but today, Wednesday, it was supposed to be the last day of the quarantine or the, uh, um, the soft quarantine, correct? Right. So what would be well, the it wasn't a quarantine. It Her. was essential activities. Sorry. Only. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. We're, on, we're on the same page. Um, yeah. what, what's the next move then? What's the next move is that sometime later this afternoon, you're going to be getting everyone, all of our students and uh, staff are going to be getting an email uh, updating where we are uh, with the essential activities only strategy. We're going to be uh, loosening things up a bit for students, but yet being very, very restrictive in certain ways, uh, particularly a large, the, about the large gatherings, et cetera. And uh, we certainly hope our students continue to stay vigilant because that's critically important. Uh, we're not back at the level. We need to be down uh, significantly below 0.2% and stay there consistently uh, in order to kind of have some sense of assurance that we'll be able to make it through the rest of this uh, semester uh, in the hybrid model that we intended. So we'll be laying out and we're gonna be announcing some things that Student Affairs has come up with that is gonna provide alternative things for our students to do, particularly undergraduates, rather than going to large house parties and those kinds of gatherings. And we're telling our students, just stay away from places that are not abiding by the governor's and the city's mandate about large gatherings. And whether it's a restaurant or a private gathering, it doesn't matter. If people are not following the rules, we're asking our students to avoid them because otherwise we'll continue to be uh, uh, very restricted in what we're able to do for the rest of this semester and maybe the rest of the academic year. So you'll be getting all that later this afternoon. Okay. And just uh, going off of that, I'm not sure if you're aware, but on Monday, there was a small protest on the quad that of students calling themselves People Over Profit Champaign-Urbana. 
and uh, they were protesting uh, the fact that we're back on campus and they were demanding a 30% student refund, a conting contingency plan uh, whenever the campus closes, hazard pay, uh, more transparency regarding COVID-19, and a meeting with administration. Um, would, could we expect per uh, perhaps an answer to uh, basically what they're requesting? Well, we, we've received the email uh, from them, and uh, we will be responding in short order. But let me say unequivocally, there is not another university in this country that has been more transparent about COVID-19 than this university. We gave every student the option to study remotely. We didn't force anybody to come back to campus. So in some ways, it's, it's very concerning to me of uh, the protest with the optics that somehow or another they're here because we made them come, which is fundamentally not true, and they know that. And uh, we also gave our faculty the option of teaching remotely or coming back and teaching in a hybrid face-to-face -face, face -face model. And so it's pretty uh, clear from my perspective that people are, that chose to come back are here because they wanted to be here that there was some value proposition for being on campus. And we have about, you know, 9,500 students that are taking courses remotely, but more than 60% of those decided to come back. Why? Because of the out of classroom opportunity to be on campus, to engage with friends and the other uh, accoutrements that come with being on a university campus. But we also made it clear that if you decided to come back to campus, there were certain things that you were going to have to abide by. That was getting tested twice a week, wearing face covering, social distancing in the classroom, wearing masks in the classroom, wearing masks outside when you can't social distance. And so we were very, very transparent about what this was going to be like. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know how we can be more transparent. We've been flexible. We kept people employed during the spring and all the way through the summer when we really, uh, because we felt a strong sense of commitment to our employees, we paid our graduate students, we paid our undergraduate workers all the way up until the end of, of their uh, contracts or their appointment period. So, you know, I understand our students have every right to free speech, but I think it's also important in a university environment that uh, be, to be factual. Uh, you know, we're not perfect. Uh, we're learning from this experience each and every day, and we pivot, as you saw last week, because of the data. We decided that we didn't need to test faculty and some of the graduate students twice a week, and we put all of our focus on testing undergraduate students to make sure that we are mitigating the spread, and we're not just testing twice a week because we can we're testing twice a week because it's important with the sensitivity of our tests. It can catch, a, it can detect a virus long before you become contagious. And it's contagious, uh, you can become contagious over a few days after contracting the virus. So those two tests bracket the time that you have enough viral load that we can connect, connect detect it with our tests. And before you start to shed the disease, and the whole goal is to pull those people out, put them in isolation, quarantine all of the ones that they've been in contact with so that we can mitigate the spread of this disease. And it's all about keeping this university safe. And uh, as we have some two students that were protesting, I can tell you, Provost Gangelaris and I heard from hundreds of those students that made it very, very clear that their preference was to be back here and Urbana-Champaign. Right, yeah. And I would like to add that, um, particularly online, they they weren't getting the same amount of feedback that I guess they thought they would be getting. But it, obviously, it was a, a bigger deal that a surprising amount of people showed up to this protest, and so that's why I felt like it needed to be addressed. Yeah. That being said, then, um, you did mention testing. How has the testing, testing been going on? Uh, I know that... Things were a little bit slow in the beginning, but how have things improved? Well, things have improved.
little dramatically, number one, because we've got additional uh, staff. We have the three eight-hour shifts and running almost seven days a week. Uh, we have a mobile testing lab that just was delivered about a week ago. Uh, that mobile testing lab is now being equipped to supplement our testing capability. For um, the first day of class, we had a mad rush because uh, we had encouraged students to get tested before the first day of class, but fortunately for a number of reasons, a number of them didn't do that. And so we ran almost over 18,000 tests that first day and all running between 14, 15,000 tests almost on a daily basis since then. And almost there's very few days except on weekends where the tests are under 10,000. And so there were some uh, technology glitches, some equipment issues, some data download issues that we had at one point that slowed the return of the results because our goal is to get the results within five to 24 hours is our goal. And now that we've made some changes, we're starting to see much uh, faster turnaround and we're getting back up to the very rapid uh, turnaround that's necessary for us to do the, the isolation, the quarantine and the contact tracing that's required to keep our community safe. So things are improving. Uh, the SHIELD team has made some adjustments. Uh, the efficiency of the testing protocol is being modified. We're changing the size of the test tube that we used. Uh, eventually, all the testing tents will be utilizing a much smaller test tube with a straw to help facilitate the uh, transfer of the saliva that you pull in your mouth and you put into the test tube to be tested. All of that is gonna help facilitate uh, faster returns because the smaller tube goes into a much larger rack and we've also are building and, and uh, purchasing robotics because the first two weeks, a lot of this was done by hand pipetting. I don't know if you've ever done a lot of hand pipetting, but it's a laborious and tiring process. And so we're automating the front end of the analysis using robotics uh, so that uh, you will be able to process the samples uh, with uh, uh, a significant less human uh, labor than you would have had to do before. Okay. Now, my my question would be then is, when the weather starts getting a little cooler, uh, how are we going to be able, able to transition to still doing the tests when it's like 30, 20 degrees outside? Well, uh, we're thinking about that, of course. As you know, we have one, at least one indoor test site. And so the team is starting to think now about how do you, say, for example, provide uh, heat inside of some of these tents, which is possible, or whether or not some of them may be moving indoors. But yes, we're not going to sit around and wait till it's below zero before we figure this out. So that decision is forthcoming. Okay, sounds good.